Well, Sanctus, good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us here right now live or of course later on demand. No matter who you are, where you are in the world, whether you're connected to Sanctus or checking us out, you're most welcome today. Getting to know people takes time. I mean, we all know this. You discover someone, you hang out with them, and they maybe move from acquaintance to friend to best friend. Or maybe you're dating, and you know the first date and the second date or third date, these days virtual or in the old days, when you could physically actually have dinner or lunch with someone, you begin to get to know them. You learn likes, you learn dislikes, you begin to have arguments, you have disagreements, you find out where you agree together, you have common interests, you have hobbies, and then you decide if you no longer can date the person because they don't put pineapple on their pizza. I mean, these are huge things in life. And then marriage. I mean, after dating, if you choose to get married and there is a marriage moment, there are always things to discover with your spouse. But actually, the reason why you keep dating your spouse post-marriage is to remember and rediscover the things you knew. Now, I want that image in your mind because this is the goal of this mini-series. Uh, if you've become friends with our church or you're checking this church out online during this COVID moment or just before, in other words, if you're dating us, you're really going to find out who you're dating and if you want to keep going or not. And if you are committed to this local church, that is, you've been called and you're committed and you're among us and together, we're going to rediscover or actually continue in the common roots we hold together so we can continue to rally and then prepare to rally again, evaluate again, and prepare to move forward, like I was saying a few weeks ago. Now, back in 2018, I released a book called Convergence. The goal of the book was simple. It was in a broad way to outline our common ministry convictions, our bias for ministry. The goal was to start giving our church a common script so we could talk the same and act the same and walk in the same direction. So for the next three weeks, I want to either introduce or reintroduce our core bias behind why we do what we do in ministry. Now, I want to make this very clear up front. This is not the John Thompson show at all. I'm not trying to sell books. What this is, is the story of our church to this point. This is the ongoing hope and expectation and struggle for us to keep walking in God-given power and to build, ready, right long-term expectations so we never over-promise in Jesus' name or under-promise in Jesus' name. This is how we keep building Sanctus Church. This is how we keep growing in real power as we all give time, effort, and persevere together. So let's start here. Convergence is when three unexpected things come together. Spiritual gifts, spiritual disciplines or holy habits, and the unusual work of the Holy Spirit called revival. Now, these three things converge to form an authentic Christian life. Let me just stop here. Some of you are like, oh, John, I've been to this church for years. I think I'm going to go and listen to someone else because I've heard all this before. No, no, no. Hold on. Reintroduction and remembering matters, matters. But more than that, some of the application in the next three weeks is really going to matter to us as a church. We have talked so many times how Jesus modeled these three factors in his humanity, though he remained and always is God. And it's so important that if he modeled them, we follow. And they also, in this day, in 2021, are the signs of the living church, the one that Jesus founded, the one that he promised would prevail and the gates of hell would not win. Now, over the last 50 years, thinking caps on, over the last 50 years, Attempts at adaptation by local churches have focused on these things. Organizational models, finding the right leader, strategies, and the ongoing use of technology. Now, all this is good. All of this is needed. Yes to right leaders and character. Yes to about being honest about personality, ability, and time. Yes to strategic planning. Yes to defined process. Yes, knowing the felt needs of a neighborhood or city. But none of these are the key. Models will always have a shelf life and all pastors and all leaders are just interim. We don't own any of this. We're here today and gone tomorrow. We're just stewarding what God has given us in this moment. And if the standard to develop a church model revolves around finding ideas that work in today's world 
only will be limited and controlled by the cultural and political factors of today alone. But see, it's our ability as people and also as a local church to adapt while keeping that concrete core to build on. And see, that's what we're going to think about, pray about, and walk through together in this mini-series. Now, many of us who have Christian history, I know many of us don't, but we who have Christian history, we have tended to live our spiritual lives in church settings where one or two of those things aren't taught or practiced with the other. Churches tend to focus on one of these and exclude or minimize the other two. One church makes spiritual practices the epicenter of discipleship. Others, they only talk about spiritual gifts and others long for revival and every single big gathering is called a revival even if it's not and it produces nothing, it's a revival. Maybe you grew up in that type of church. But convergence describes believers' determination or believers that are determined to see all three things come together over a long period of time in a local church. Let me say this again. If Jesus provided that model, it should fit every single local church on the face of the earth, no matter how we might differ on all sorts of other things. So here's the summary I always do. and We're going to unpack this over the next few weeks. Spiritual gifts are normal, are expected, and they're assigned to each Christian by the Holy Spirit. You don't get to choose from the buffet. He tells you what you get. And you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. Spiritual disciplines or holy habits are normal and should be practiced by everyone and all of them are open to us. Now, revival is not normal and it's not guaranteed like the other two. If and when God moves in times of revival and renewal, there, of course, will be a greater openness to what God is doing. It's not about giving the gifts. It's about fanning them into flame. The pattern all the time is you see dormant or ignored gifts come active and the love of the disciplines goes through the roof during these unexpected moves of God. But you can never confuse the three. They're different. And why can't you confuse the three? Because expectations can kill and shipwreck your faith or breathe life into it. Remember when Jesus talked about wineskins, many attempts at adaptation by local churches always focus on changing models. Fine. But I love what Jesus said in Luke 5, 39. No one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. A lot of the wine aficionados in our church are like, yes. But here's the thing. Convergence, our bias, recognizes the usefulness of new wineskins and new wine, but doesn't lose sight of the old wine or throw it out. Now, if it's hard for you to imagine what I'm describing, let me do this. You might or might not know some names, but here's how we describe our current experience to leaders in other churches. He said, I, I, this is what we say. If Tim Keller, who is a Presbyterian evangelical evangelist who lives in New York City, planted a church with John Wimber, who's from California, who's uh, totally Californian and charismatic, beside Dallas Willard, who's a world-class professor and expert on spiritual disciplines, and Jay Packer, who's a really famous theologian, all got together and took turns preaching in a exegetical way and we all sang Bethel and Hillsong worship songs and we communion we took communion like Anglicans but we were growing a multi-site church and we planned like Andy Stanley we'd be pleased because that's basically who we are see there's no battle between the old wines old wine and new wine those apparent contradictions are evidence of the convergence that is our bias here now it is easier to have all these different separated ideas in separated churches. It's just easier. The spiritual gift people are over there and the spiritual discipline people are over there and the revival is certain. No, no, no. But that's not God's heart. We need all this long-term in one house to have the greatest effect. So let me go back to this idea of common scripting. You see, this is a matter of language. This is more than just using the same words, which of course often leads to long and contentious arguments without ever acknowledging that we're using the same words, but we have different meanings behind the words. Does it sound like what we've lived through for the last 12 months? You say a word, someone else says a word, but you mean different things when you say that thing. An effective common script implies shared vocabulary and an agreed meaning. And this is one of the hidden keys to unity. And as a pastor in today's very politically dangerous and, and porous world, I'm keenly aware that our congregations are completely diverse. 
We're living in a moment where co- basically denominations are collapsing. People are continuously on the move. We deal with spiritual nomads in our spiritual worship services every week physically, let alone now online. And often we're not even aware of who's sitting among us. So let me just say, this is my observation here in our own church. It is not unusual at all to have someone who grew up in a Dutch reform or Christian reform background sitting beside a Pentecostal who's come to Sanctus because they love the worship style that we have because it's similar, but they're desperate to be taught something more. And then sitting beside the Pentecostal is a former Baptist who desperately likes the preaching here, but wants to encounter the living God and be a little bit more free. And so they've come together and they're all sitting beside a new ager who just renounced the new age and is just starting to follow Jesus. And then they're all sitting beside a seeker who's an agnostic who hasn't believed any of this. And all of them are talking and responding to what's happening from their particular point of view. Now, I've experienced this for years here. And I always tell this joke, but it it does bring it home. It's not haha, but it's just helpful because it it matters. When I preach a really good sermon, let's say it's very biblical and it's orthodox and everyone laughed and cried and people become Christians and we all are closer to Jesus, a much more conservative type person will come to me and, and they really do. And they are always carrying an ESV Bible and they always say the phrase, that's a good word, John, good word today. Five seconds later, a more charismatic or former Pentecostal will come and they say, should about a Kia, should about a Kia, about a Honda. There was the glory of God around you. And there was angels around you. And oh my goodness, you are so anointed today. Now, again, I, I bring this up for a reason. Those two people are describing the exact same thing. And then the agnostic comes along and says, that was a very good speech. <laughs> but if you put them in a room and they use that language, they wouldn't even know they're describing the same what? Thing. So what's so important is we have, we have people using the same words to talk about different things and different words to talk about the same thing, but we need to communicate clearly. So as a result, we've worked hard as a church to identify core and key values we hold, including spiritual gifts and spiritual disciplines. And we work very hard to continually reference and patiently explain to everyone what we mean by that thing. So increasingly, we will think that same thing, we'll use the same words, and we can evaluate experience together. Again, that's why we've done two major series, again, in the last 15 months, one on spiritual gifts and one on spiritual disciplines. We brought them back. And by the way, if you're watching online now, they're going to come up in the chat. If not, you can go back to our podcast. They're both there, one in 2019, one in 2020. So you can have the common language we use about gifts and disciplines. Okay, that's bias one. Let's talk about bias too. Let's talk about our major and most important source, the Bible, Scripture. Now, I address this a little bit when I walk through the spiritual discipline of study in that spiritual discipline series. Let me read the best description from the Bible about itself. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture. When Paul was writing this, it included everything from Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament. But it applies to the New Testament also. Already at this point, Peter is calling Paul's work Scripture. Matthew and Luke are quoting Mark or beginning to, and Paul was quoting Luke. This is all forming. Now, all scripture is God's word to us. And every time I talk about the nature of scripture, I end up quoting uh, J.A. Packer's definition because it's so good. Christianity, he writes, is the true worship and true worship and true service of the true God, humanity's creator and redeemer. It is a religion that rests on revelation. No one would know the truth about God or be able to relate to him in a personal way had God not acted first to make himself known. But God has acted. And the 66 books of the Bible, the 39 before Jesus, the 27 after, are together the record, the interpretation, the expression, the embodiment of his self-disclosure. God and godliness are the Bible's uniting themes. So all scripture is God breathed. God is the basis and the foundation. God is the author of this book. All scripture is God breathed. It's useful. It's practical. It's constructive to do what? To teach us about what? Well, who is God and how do we meet him and how are we changed by him and what does he want? But not only teaching us, it rebukes and corrects us. This tells us 
is our worldview, how we see the world from God's view, right or wrong. It also tells us ethics, how to live, how we think and how we act. See, the Bible has to be the ultimate lens, the glasses where you see family through, life through, money through, sex through, sexuality through, relationships through, power through, politics through, race through, economics through, gender through. See, the more you sit with and under the Word of God, and the more you listen to the written Word of God, the more you'll actually hear God, and the more you submit to God's Word, the more each one of us will be taught corrected and rebuked. And oh, why do we need this? Let me tell you why. Because all of our thinking, not the person you don't like online, all of our thinking is tainted by sin. And much of the time in all of our experiences, my family, my cultural background, and the news outlet I listen to has more power than God's word, which all need to be flipped. The Bible is also God's gift to lead us to righteousness. See, a God-centered, God-pleasing, God-conformed life loves the scriptures. But there's another layer here at Sanctus. See, if you're dating us or you're with us, you need to get this. This is when you need to write this down. It's not just we agree what the Bible is, but to keep moving forward together, we need to talk about how we at Sanctus handle the scriptures. I'm not talking about my preaching style. So I want you to write down two words, normative, and regulative, normal and regular, normative, regulative. What do we mean? Normative means this. We have here at at our church a robust orthodox doctrine of the Bible. It is God's word. It It is the source for faith, life, and practice. But we also have a very significant freedom in application. In other words, here's what normative means. If you find it in the scriptures, you gotta do it. If you don't find it in the scripture, but it doesn't violate the spirit or the letter of scripture, you can do that too. Contrast this with the regulative position. If you find something in the scripture, you have to do it. But if you don't find it in the Bible, you shouldn't do it. Okay, here's the way to clarify this. Does God's word from Genesis to Revelation tell us everything we as a church should do and should not do? Does the Bible present a restrictive collection of of directives that we must obey in detail without ever falling short or going beyond in any way? Or does God's word give us a reliable framework, limits, directions, and examples that provide ultimate guidance, but don't necessarily prescribe every single specific step to be taken? Now, for many of us, again, who have Christian background, The assumption is faithfulness and obedience are determined by how closely we see the Bible as regulative. In practice, however, though, most of us handle God's word more more or less like a normative person, even when we don't know we're doing it. This becomes obvious when we come up against a church practice or an experience that is unfamiliar to us, and immediately in our mind we can't find a passage or verse So when we say, I don't see that in scripture, we reveal our regulative view. Now this objection is not always saying, if I can't see it, it isn't there. Rather, much of the time it's saying, my internal review of the Bible has not yielded an instance where something like that is either mentioned or specifically commanded, so that shouldn't be done. Well, that's really well and good until you actually examine everything we do as Christians by the same standard. Much of the time when I hear people in our church say, well, I don't see that in the scripture, so it cannot be accepted. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Show me a New Testament worship service in detail from the scriptures that that tell us hymns or or, or courses and communion every week or, or all the time or sometimes. And do we have to have baptisms every week? And oh, can you tell me? See, it's not in there. Please show me small groups, drama, worship teams, children's ministry, church architecture, youth pastors, children's work, go on and on. There is a mind-boggling assortment of must-haves and must-dos that are part of our church life and every other church life that actually are not found in the scriptures. There's nothing wrong with these. Actually, they're great. But we can't present them as, thus saith the Lord, The answer, but we've always done that, is not the same as the Bible tells me to do that. See, 
why does this matter? This is so important when it comes to our biases convergence. When it comes to spiritual gifts and when it comes to spiritual disciplines and unusual spiritual experiences, much of the time in the Bible, we told, we're told they exist, but there are no details after this. So let me give you an example. Jesus says, they're having trouble casting out a demon. <laughs> and Jesus says, this kind does not come out without prayer or some versions praying and fasting. Now, here's what's wild about this. Jesus says there are obviously different types of demons, different sermon, different strengths. And he says, but this kind, not that kind, this kind doesn't come out unless you pray or pray and fast. And then you're like, and where's the five point sermon on how, how long do I pray and how long do I fast? And is it a Daniel fast or a full hardcore fast? And what type of prayers and how loud does the Bethel music need to be? See, he says nothing. He just says, you got to pray and fast about this thing. See, that's the difference between regulative and normative. We know we need to pray and fast, but we're not told how. So you have to build something out beyond that. That's not in the scriptures. So let me make this really clear. If you're like, where are you going, John? Here's our bias. If it's in the scriptures and it's specific here at Sanctus, we're going to specifically obey. In many cases, God's word is clear. Don't commit adultery. That's clear. Don't murder. Clear. Jesus is God, clear. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. No one gets to the Father except through him, clear. But there are many, many other things in the scriptures that actually are not expanded on that are not clear. This is critical and foundational to our view of convergence when it comes to gifts, disciplines, and revival. Okay, let's talk about another thing, another bias we have. How do we evaluate spiritual experiences at Sanctus Church? I mean, how do you really hear from God? How do you evaluate an experience you have? And how do you know, again, if it's from God, the devil, or the hummus from last night? How do you evaluate stuff being taught? Well, I would like you to picture a diamond shape in your mind. We've done this before. At the top of the diamond is scripture. And the other points of the diamond are reason, experience, and tradition. Now, Scripture is on top. It's the ultimate source. It's the Supreme Court. It has the final say, but it's not the only source. Why? Why is that? I thought we believed in the Bible alone. Oh, no, no, no. See, the Bible in itself tells us there are other courts where God speaks. So if you actually believe what the Bible says, you have to have these other things at the table. So the next point is tradition. It's easy and sometimes popular to malign history. But from the point of view that we have called convergence, one of the key lessons of history is the rediscovery that our spiritual great-grandparents got a lot of things right. There is a place for Christian history and tradition to be brought in to help us interpret today. If we categorically vote out 2,000 years of accumulated Christian experience, and we pretend that we've developed something new and unfettered by the past, we delude ourselves from either learning from their mistakes or learning from their victories. C.K. Chesterton put this best. Tradition is allowing our ancestors to have a vote. That's what we need. This is why church history matters, especially in this moment. There is little that we are facing today, politically, religiously, ethnically, that has not been confronted to the church in its past. The fact that Jesus' church has prevailed for 2,000 years tells us they figured a lot of good things out. We have to practice great humility about the generations that have gone before us. So when we're evaluating things, we need to say, is it in the scriptures? And do we see this in church history? And how did they deal with it? Now, not all church history, by the way, is, is equally helpful or brings equal clarity. Let me give you an example. I love, for example, Luther and Calvin for their immeasurable help and work in the area of doctrine during the Protestant Reformation. But see, they lived in Europe during the, the, the moment when everyone was a Christian, just the wrong type of Christian. That's why I, as a pastor, read the church fathers from basically 90 AD to 500 AD a lot more because they were living and pastoring in a highly sexualized, pervasively violent, aggressively pluralistic environment. See, Sanctus, listen, in 2021, living in Toronto, we're not living in, in, in Wittenberg or Geneva. We're living in Rome and Corinth. We've got to talk to the Christians who lived in those places. Uh, the, the third thing that help, is helpful is reason. Reason. Now, this is complicated because, of course, our reason is affected by sin. 
It's fallen. It can't be trusted absolutely. The claim that we can just reasonably work everything out is foolhardy, just like the same with experience. But reason is one of God's gifts. And used with humility is essential to read, understand, and interpret, and apply the scriptures, and to understand experiences. We, we as a culture in the last six months have lost the gift of reason. We, we have let experience and lies have more power than truth. Now, to acknowledge the importance of input in thinking of others guards against us trusting our own reasoning capacity is infallible. The last thing is experience. This is the last one in the diamond. When we're dealing with something, is it in the scripture? What does it say if it's there? And what, is, what did the church deal with it? And let's talk about reason, but let's still talk about our experience. Now, I am aware, like I just said, that we have exalted personal experience in our culture to a, deific- to a deified way. Like we've made it God. Our culture has actually so loved experience, we now view experts as dangerous because we feel something. The sin of our culture is we feel it, so it must be right. And of course, that's sin. That's wrong. And yet experience is not wrong in itself all the time. It's still significant. And life is tied to experience. I find so many pastors who are deeply suspicious and outright against using experience to filter and understand God's word and also situations in the church. But see, here's the image I've used for years. You've got to look at experiences like a plug in the wall. The question you need to ask is not what is the experience, but what is the source? Where is the experience coming from? Is it from God? Is it it from the devil? Is it mental illness? Is it something else? See, this is incredible. See, it being weird or out of the box doesn't actually tell you what's really happening. As Christians, we should never dismiss experience or deny it, but help interpret it. The whole Christian life is to know God. Not the Greek sense of knowing, I know about, but the Hebrew sense of knowing, intellectually and experientially knowing. That's why the Bible uses the phrase to know your spouse when talking about sex. (laughs) Because the reality is you don't just intellectually participate in that. You experientially and intellectually experience that. So this is key to see our church keep walking in true life. Too few of us who, for example, in my job, preach, stop and consider the vast amount, the ocean of spiritual experiences in the lives of our congregation. Some of them evil, some of them good, some of them neutral, some of them, again, broken, some of them from God. But if we never acknowledge those experiences, we confirm in our people's mind they've experienced something that they should not, because it's just not talked about, or their experience has little uh, or nothing to offer other believers or actually isn't even real even though they're experiencing it. Now, as crucial as it is to recognize the supremacy of God's word, if we ignore or invalidate any of these other points, tradition, reason, experience, and remember, connected to experience is gifts and disciplines, our capacity capacity to correctly respond to God's word and help other people in their walk is limited. This is a major bias we have here. Okay, fifth. Another major assumption we have at Sanctus is the necessity to view the incarnation of Jesus, God taking on flesh, as the foundation for any model we do as a church. This has been held by pastors and and missionaries for 2,000 years. Jesus' incarnation is one of the reasons why church models change, can change, and much must change. Like, this is so important. Like, if you talk to people who are Muslim, they say, well, God's language is Arabic, and actually, you can only read the Quran properly in Arabic. We, we don't have that. We have no Mecca in our movement. We have no language. Or The whole point is we are called to mutate. Jesus was a 30-year-old Jewish man who got up and lived fully in his own community. Later, as more and more people from different backgrounds became his followers, they took his spirit and his word... But the style and look and emphasis of the different early churches began to change and look different depending on the culture they were a part of, and that's God's plan. My current assignment is here at Sanctus Church, a large, growing, multi, uh, multicultural mega church in the suburbs of Toronto. So yes, we have a little feel where we look a little bit like Walmart and a little bit like Starbucks. And I don't expect this style of church will be around in 100 years. And that's the point. The key is not to theologically enshrine 
our temporal church culture, but to admit our current iteration is only a model that must change. When we understand the difference between timeless, eternal, and timely, we'll see convergences found probably in every single church on earth. Some of you grew up in churches that were deeply ethnically sort of unified, homogeneous. It was like one group. And, and it's hard to get beyond that and go, oh my goodness, so what's cultural and what's, what's timeless? That's what we're talking about. We have a bias here that this is, we, we're not going to spiritualize our church culture here in the sense of we do church like this and it's okay, but it's the things we do at the core that matter eternally. Here's one of our last biases. It's called the three-legged stool. I remember sitting in a class when my professor pointed to a three-legged stool and he said, do you see that? I said, yes. I had no clue that my life was going to change forever when he did this. He said, see that stool? I said, yes. He says, John, if you take one of the legs away, what happens? I said, it wobbles. He said, if you sit on it? I said, oh, it's going down. Right. He says, that's what's happening all over the world in multiple churches. Having a clear view of Jesus doesn't actually in itself do enough for personal discipleship. We can know a lot of truth about Jesus, but still live ineffective, disobedient, and powerless lives. See, you need three things happening in your church all the time at its core, not one. He says you need to deal with allegiance all the time, truth all the time, and power all the time. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, allegiance primarily is faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's not just a body of belief, it's active. It's when you say, I now follow Jesus, he's my Savior and, and Lord, and I'm going to keep walking in that direction. And this matches up, he said, with what we see in John 14, 6, that Jesus claimed, I am the way. He says, but you can't just deal with allegiance. You have to deal with truth. That's why in Acts chapter 2, the first description of the early church, they're listening to the apostles' teaching. It's why, again, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures God breathed and useful to teach us and rebuke and correct us and train us. And this matches up with what Jesus claimed about himself. He's not just the way, he's the truth. But the third leg of the stool represents power, spiritual power. Becoming, uh, because every one of us lives in a human moment and a fallen moment, we can be, of course, under the influence of the devil and sin. And it's crucial that we depend on the power made available to us by Jesus and the Father when he sends his spirit to indwell in us. See, we're not just talking about the right doctrine of the Holy Spirit, but active, immediate, promised, experienced work of the Spirit. It's one thing to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit in the Apostles' Creed. It's another thing to see his work in your life like you read in Scripture. Huh. And this lines up with Jesus saying, I am the what? Life. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, it's abundantly clear that Jesus deals with allegiance, truth, and power all the time. Here at Sanctus Church, we are convinced this is a lesson that God wants to teach his church in every generation. If you sit on a stool with only one leg or two legs, you'll fall over. You're saying, John, I'm a little confused. Okay, let me work this out. Many, many churches only talk about allegiance. You need to meet Jesus, follow Jesus. You need to accept him. Usually the pastor is an evangelist. And at the end of the day, all these people become Christians and allegiance, allegiance, allegiance. But then there are people like, I need to eat. I need to be taught and I need to experience them. They're like, no, no, more meat. And you fall over. The churches I grew up in were actually all about truth. Preach more, more Bible studies, more preaching, more truth, more truth, more truth, and everything's going to be okay. But what about lost people who need to hear about allegiance and, and is God beyond some doctrine statement even real and can I experience him? Where's, where's the power? No, no, just more truth. And you fall over. And then there are other people, and maybe you grew up in churches like this, where it's all about power and all about spiritual gifts and all about fire tunnels and all this stuff. And you're like, okay, fine, but where's the life change? And is anyone teaching us anything? And I'm not even sure where these experiences are coming from. And what are these, these seeking non-Christians even think of this? And you fall over. See, it becomes an all or nothing deal. But let me just say it like this. Our bias is we're going to continue in one house to have to call people to allegiance, continue to preach truth so we remove lives, lies, and also participate in holy power. Let me summarize the stool analogy this way. Wrong allegiance is only replaced by right allegiance. I once was a Buddhist, now I'm a follower of Jesus. I once was a self-sufficient agnostic, now I totally rely on Jesus. Allegiance. Allegiance, after that's clear, is then worked out by truth. Many of us who know Jesus still struggle with lies and, distor and distortions in our thinking. Our hearts accuse us. The devil accuses us. And we need his word in a lifelong process 
to conform us. Truth. But only unholy power can be removed by holy power. Faith in Jesus and knowledge of the Bible does not necessarily prepare us for the immense power that evil can bring and bear in our lives. We need all three legs to hold the stool. Okay, I know that's a lot. I know this is going to be one of these sermons you need to take some time, probably listen to again. But this is who we, this is the bias for our ministry. This is undergirds everything we do, spiritual gifts, spiritual disciplines, how we handle the scripture, okay with spiritual experiences, all this stuff. So here's some questions I want you to think about this week. And if you're in a connect group, which I hope you are, I want you to talk about this week. Wonder, number one, how do you handle God's word? How do you handle God's word? Regulative, normative, or a mix of both? Talk that out. Two, how does what I've said today help you begin to understand why Sanctus Church feels and functions a little different than the churches you might know down the street. See, a lot of people that used to come here who still think we're Christians, still think we're going to heaven and left, when I really hear what they're saying, they go, I don't, I don't understand. I love your preaching and the worship's great, but you have this weird, yeah, it's convergence. Talk about that. Maybe you can talk about how this is different than what you grew up with. Talk about that diamond, Scripture, reason, experience, tradition. How, how that becomes the core of how we evaluate things. Ask yourself the question, do you, do, you, do you like that? Which one do you like more? What do you need to work out with that? I just used this three-legged stool analogy in saying if you don't have all three, you, you fall over. Uh, uh, allegiance, meeting and having faith in Jesus and truth, teaching and, and power, signs and wonders. Do you tend to elevate one over the other? You feel more comfortable with one one over the other. I want you to talk about this. Why? Because you're going to see, and you have seen if you're part of us, and we're going to continue to move forward, that this is the bias that we always have sort of in the ether of our church. Have a great time talking this week. And let's just take a moment uh, to, to pray. Yeah, Lord, thanks for this moment. Yeah, thanks for what you're doing. Thanks that you modeled all this for us. Thanks that you've assigned this church, would you just continue to work out the truth of this across our church so we can stay unified together? Uh, We ask this in Jesus' name. Uh, Amen. Now, I know I just preached and we just prayed about, we'll call it our ministry bias. But we still need to end this message in this moment going way beyond Sanctus Church. Because There are millions of Christians who probably wouldn't agree with lots of what I just said, but we still have unity with them. And so we want to end this moment together with our greatest unity in Jesus. And that's why we're going to celebrate communion. So if you've got your elements ready at home, wherever you might be, I remind you that Jesus, just before he was executed and betrayed, right, he took bread at that Passover meal and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is a new covenant. And he said, this this is going to be done so you can have forgiveness. And remember then he took one of the goblets of wine. He said, this is my blood. Again, a new covenant. The forgiveness of sins. And so what unifies us with every Christian on earth? What unifies us? It's Jesus. Jesus is life, death, and resurrection. His promise of forgiveness. His promise of uh, resurrection. And every time we take communion, the Bible tells us to remember Jesus' death. Tells us to take a moment to confess our sins. You need to do that. We all need to do that. This is a reminder that one day we'll eat with him face to face and we'll never do this again because we'll be with him. But this is also a reminder of our unity that goes beyond the good intention bias of many churches. So thanks, Jesus, that our, our unity is even beyond us. Thanks that we are bound together with you and with millions of others. Thanks for your death and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord Jesus for this moment we can celebrate and remember in this really difficult time that you still win. Uh, We just thank you in Jesus' name. So when you're ready, you can just take that communion moment with your family, with yourself, or with others. Let's do that together. Thanks, Lord. Thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that we have hope. 
We celebrate this today in Jesus' name. Amen.